Our third reading this morning comes to us from the story of the Pentecost found in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. As I always do, friends, I invite you to listen for God's word to you. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alight each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard the sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans? Every one of them? How, then, are each of them speaking in our native languages? Parthians, Medes, and Eliamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phygria, and, Pamph and Pamphylia, Egypt and the regions of Libya bordering Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own languages. They were surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? And others jeered at them and saying, they're full of new wine. Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suspect. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young will see visions, your elders dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in these days, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness and the moon changed into blood before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes and everyone who, call, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It feels good to be back in this pulpit. And with everything that's going on right now, the uncertainties and dangers of this moment in our history, I hope that our return to the sanctuary with the handful of us that were here today leading our virtual worship services, socially distanced and masked, of course, will be a blessing to you. Normally, I like to start my Pentecost sermons by saying something like, Happy Pentecost, everyone. Today is the birthday of Christianity. But church... I don't feel particularly happy on this specific Pentecost. Rather, I find myself in this pulpit before you worried and heartbroken and angry. I feel all these things as we have passed that grim mark of the over 100,000 lives lost to this pandemic in this country alone. More poignantly though, I feel all these things in the aftermath of the lynching of George Floyd and of Ahmaud Aubrey and the killing of Breonna Taylor and the threat against Christian Cooper and the countless acts of atrocities and aggressions committed against our siblings of color each and every single day in our country. As the great 20th century theologian Karl Barth is said to have once quipped, we who preach must do so with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And on this Pentecost, friends, I intend to do so. For if the stories in our biblical narrative are to speak to us today, 
if they are, as we believe, to be the encountering of the very word of God, Jesus found within our passages, then we dare not attempt to interpret and hear the story outside of what is happening in our world and in our lives today. If we tried, I think, we would miss what the Spirit is trying to tell us. And the Spirit, isn't that what today is supposed to be all about? In the Pentecost story in Acts, we find the disciples, those inner 11, plus one replacement, Matthias, who was voted on um, by the session, if you will. And about 108 more, all together in one place, perhaps worshiping. I like to think of this as being the first Galilean church of Jerusalem. And they're doing this, and all of a sudden, the Spirit comes, and it does not do so quietly. It descends upon them like a tornado, so loud that it attracts people from around to come to this building to see what on earth is going on there. And in the midst of that holy storm, something that eyewitnesses could only describe as being like a flame alights on all 120 of the people in there, and they begin to speak in languages that are not their own. And the crowds come, and they were... Confounded, They were stirred up. They were bewildered. They were thrown into confusion. For the 120 people that they saw gather their speaking languages that were not their own, that they did not grow up with, and that they did not speak, they were speaking. The multitude assembled there could understand their own languages being spoken to them. And this vast international group this crowd of Jewish folks from around the diaspora were there in Jerusalem, comprised both of Jewish pilgrims who would have been there for the festival of the weeks, as well as Jewish immigrants from throughout the empire who had since returned to Jerusalem and settled there. And there they were, hearing this group of Galileans speaking in their languages, languages from Africa and Asia and Europe. And they see this, and they hear this, and they are confounded. They're confounded. What is happening? What is going on? To which Peter stands from among the other apostles and raises his voice and preaches. Reciting Joel, he preaches to them that this is the day of the Lord. And this fiery, this eschatological end times sermon happens for this fiery eschatological time in the life of the people. But there's also a little bit of humor, right? Some instigators within this bewildering crowd begin to jeer that, oh, you must be drunk, to which Peter responds, drunk, but it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Now, perhaps those jeering just don't really know how alcohol works, or maybe wine was a lot different back then than it is now. I I don't know about you, but I certainly have never heard of somebody learning a completely different language just because they've had a little bit too much. But anyway, as biblical scholar Margaret Amer writes, quote, In Luke's telling, Pentecost engenders fear and bewilderment rather than celebration. The parallel here is to the eschatological day of the Lord. Pentecost is both its forerunner and, paradoxically, its fulfillment. The Holy Spirit proves not to be a quiet, heavenly dove, but rather a violent force that blows the church into being. That church consisted mainly of immigrants, people of different languages and cultures with different mother tongues. To these, the message goes forth, a message of the coming day of the Lord, full of heavenly portents and prophetic women, slaves, and men. But in the midst of the chaos of Pentecost, rests an anchor. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, end quote. The first Pentecost was not a celebratory event. People probably weren't wearing red. There probably wasn't a sheet cake in the fellowship hall decked out in red frosting waiting for them afterwards. But there was some good preaching. Peter, who only 50 days ago, remember, was busy denying Jesus, is now here proclaiming the day of the Lord. He was, as we say in preacher circles, bringing it. 
And from here, with the coming of the Spirit, descending not like a dove, but like a firestorm, which as someone from the Northwest who has encountered such things, that is a scary sight indeed. Imagine, well, imagine a tornado, but bigger. And, you know, it's fire. That's basically a firestorm. And Peter's preaching is right there with the theme of the inflammatory. Here, his quoting of the prophet Joel again. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness, and the moon will be changed into blood before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Empowered by the Spirit, Peter calls this crowd filled with people from different cultures who speak different languages, who have different skin tones, to recognize that today is the hoped-for day of the Lord. This is the eschatological event that they had been hoping for. And the Spirit, that we normally think of as the most quiet of our triune God, is now upon them. And now, words of prophecy are heard in the voices and actions of the youth. And now the elders, they are dreaming dreams. And upon all of those who seek to follow God, God's spirit shall be poured out. And in the midst of blood and smoke and fire, they shall prophesy. This great gift, the Holy Spirit, is now upon them. And their differences, here notably those of culture and language and origin and presumably gender and, of course, what we will now call race, are transcendent. Now, they are, of course, still there. Their differences are still there in all of their beauty, in all that we were created to be. But through the Spirit, they can understand one another. They can be with one another, and they are one. They are united as one community. That is something, by the way, that Rome was interested in doing. Rome sought to unify all those under their subjugation as one. In different points in their history, as you can imagine, they tried their darndest, and sometimes, eh, but sometimes not so much. Now, we've seen throughout the New Testament that whenever the empire tries something that is fully subverted by our God, Rome cajoles and coerces and forces through threat of its legions, whereas God, God gifts the Spirit. And the Spirit unites and transcends and inspires and emboldens. Regardless of how these human differences are read by those in power, the Spirit is there and they shall prophesy and they shall be saved. Commentator Deborah J. Mumford writes, quote, How many of our differences could be transcended if we allowed the power of the Holy Spirit to reign in our lives? What miracles could the Holy Spirit perform in our churches and communities if we embraced it and invited it into our midst? How many hearts and minds could the Holy Spirit possibly transform if we prayed for the Holy Spirit to have its ways in our communities? End quote. For that is God's intention for us. And yet, as we sit here in our living rooms, or this space, or wherever we happen to be this morning, that is not our reality. We do not live in a society that reflects that intention, that hope, that dream. Even with that wonderful motto of ours, e pluribus unum, out of many, one, which was originated apparently by Augustine, but comes to us through an 18th century British men's magazine. We do not live into that intention, do we? And watching the news over the past few days, and especially last night, was a stark reminder 
of that reality. But the thing is, friends, we never really have as a society. Everything that is happening in our nation right now, particularly from the killings to the protests, is predicated upon our nation's original sin, white supremacy. For it is white supremacy that remains an insidious evil that is woven throughout our history. It is believed to have been invented here a century before we were birthed as a nation by the planter classes in Virginia to do two things. One, to justify the horrors of generation chattel slavery, something that was novel in the human experience. And two, to ensure that all of these poor and indentured European settlers and refugees would never find solidarity with the poor enslaved Africans and thus overthrow those in power. That is actually the origins not only of racism, but of race in and of itself. It's where whiteness comes from. And with it, of course, these promises made to these desperate peoples from all over the European continent who were coming to this place. Not that, of course, those promises first came with a lot of power. Remember that when our nation was dawned, only those who were white and male and also wealthy were enfranchised. You had to own property to do such things. And I'm gonna, not going to keep you here all day with a lecture. I'll assume you know much of our history and the horrors that it wrought upon and wrote upon bodies of people of color particularly African Americans and First Peoples. But even after all this time, such things have not fully gone away. This most pernicious of evils remains with us, even now. And it infects and it forms each and every single one of us as people. Racism in our context is not just about individual prejudice which I think is where some confusion and pushback seems to happen in our culture. For of course, anyone can be bigoted and biased. But racism, per its technical and lived definition that we use in anti-racist work, is about, well, it's rooted in what we would call the structural. It's this lived combination of oppressions and power. And it's why that we who do this work, who are white like I am, confess that we are inherently racist because we are white within a white supremacist society. And we confess that white supremacy has infiltrated every institution in our society, including the church. And it is so hard to see because it is as ubiquitous to us as water is to a fish. We may or may not as individuals be bigoted. But we have these inherent privileges that are based solely on what we look like, the color of our skin. And because we live in a society where people who look like me are considered the norm, through which everything from law to media to culture is sort of based around, even in fact the color coming from you from this camera right here. Initially cameras were essentially calibrated to look good for people with lighter skin. And we can sadly see around us what's happening when this cultural taboo that we've had recently of outward bias goes away. But it's with us all the time. Let me give you a story from my own experience about my own privilege as a white person. I was pulled over once in my life. I had a headlight go out on me on a road trip. And never once in my encounter with that state trooper did I ever fear that anything would go wrong in that encounter. We ended up having a good discussion for a few minutes because I suspect he was bored on that lonely highway. When I'm in a store and a worker approaches me, I assume they're doing that to, you know, sell me something, not because they think I might be there to steal. If a well-dressed person approaches me on the street, I assume it's because they think I know where, where a direction to something is which at least before everyone started having cell phones would happen to be a lot. But usually, of course, when I was traveling somewhere, so I had no idea where they were trying to get to. But these experiences of mine are very different than the experiences of my friends of color. 
and this evil that is in our midst. This evil which categorizes us by race and it's, that assumes that those of us who are white are, well, normal, while equally presuming that those who are not are lesser than, or perhaps, particularly in the case of African Americans, inherently dangerous. Well, friends, that gets us to where we are today. And if you might be wondering why so many are in our streets, it's partially because of the outrage and horror of death upon death upon death, which must be stopped. But we also have to realize, of course, how complicated things are. I have no idea if this is true outside of the Minnesota context, but the violence that we see there in that city was instigated by outsiders, not by community members protesting this murder of George, but by those who have come in for their own nefarious purposes to cause trouble. And one such group that's been known is this a group known as Accelerationists. This is a far-right, white supremacist terrorist organization, essentially, that's gathering steam and learning about themselves and training and such over the internet. And they're going forth to cause mayhem with the stated goal of starting another civil war. That's why I worry about what we're going through right now. Because once again, there are those who would take the righteous and very prophetic anger of an oppressed community and twist it for their own foul ends. A fellow pastor that I know was on the ground in Chicago yesterday in the march, when it was just simply that, a peaceful march, and saw a group of young masked white men who were clearly not part of the protest and were clearly there and had weapons to cause trouble. They were pushed back only after being confronted by a group of African-American protesters who wanted to demand and know exactly what it is they thought that they were doing. These things that are happening around us, friends, are evil. And I say that because any time one violates the image of God in a person through those horrors of racism, we commit an act of blasphemy whether this happens on an individual or a societal level. And for those of us who are the people of God, who recognize ourselves as having been gifted with the Spirit, we have to ask, as we look around, where is Jesus in all of this? And then we have to ask, where do we find ourselves? I think I know where we might find Jesus. Jesus. Because our Lord was himself the victim of a lynching as he was put upon that cross. To use the prophetic language of the great and now late, unfortunately, theologian James Cohn. We know our Jesus stands with those who are hurting, with those who are oppressed. Because our God is a God who champions those on the underside. And as we recognize this truth that we learn throughout our biblical narratives, and as we hear the prophetic words of our young people these days, and those prophetic dreams of our elders these days, and as I do so, I find myself reflecting back on what I can only call my own racism that I, as a white man in a white supremacist world, am complicit in and am compelled to repent of. And that is why I must confess to you, church, that black lives matter. Not because, of course, other lives do not matter. Of course they matter. But because we live in a society where effectively some lives really never have mattered. And some lives have never mattered as much as other lives. And because we live in that society, a society where some bodies are inherently considered to be dangerous and acted upon, and thus constantly subjected to threat and degradation and subjugation, personally don't know what other choice I have as a follower of Jesus. Because we are not just called to listen to the voices of the young and listen to the dreams of our elders. We are called to embody and live into a new reality, that of God's inbreaking realm, where all of those sinful hierarchies based upon these categories of things like race and gender that are crafted around human difference, whether real or imagined, actually don't matter. But that isn't the world that we live in right now. 
And that's why we are called to act in solidarity with all of our siblings and to embody these realities even in the midst of our own. And so, my friends, on a Pentecost such as this, I would encourage you, especially if you are white like me, to do a little praying and do a little soul searching. And I would invite you to join me in unpacking how white supremacy has had a hand in shaping who you are. If you're interested, I have a number of resources on anti-racism to get conversations started. And steps that we as people of faith, people filled with the Spirit, who are called to celebrate the wondrous beauty of human difference that God has gifted us with. who are called to seek reconciliation and love with all of our neighbors while, re while realizing that reconciliation can never happen without justice. who are equally called to oppose all those blasphemous evils, those powers and principalities of our world that would seek to harm and destroy solely based off those differences. Together, my friends, if we do the work, we can be the people that we are meant to be. We too, with the Spirit, can be the people that our world needs us to be, especially in such a time as this. Amen.